Hello, welcome back. This is the uh, third of our workshops this afternoon in our Project Speed uh, workshop program. Um, so we're now moving on to timetabling or how thinking about timetabling can help your project go well. And the converse is, of course, true. Uh, and it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Toby uh, Patrick Bailey, uh, Head of Planning and Performance at uh, Network Rail. And Toby's going to uh, take us through the work that he's been doing on uh, timetabling. So uh, over to you, Toby. Hello, thank you, David. Um, can't help but think that your your introduction prior to that break should, should have come along with some some spoiler alerts. Uh, so um, <laughs> quite quite a bit to to work through around um, how best we can help inform project development with the timetable and how we can use the timetable or or timetabling activities to be able to provide better assurance that the benefits associated with um, enhancement projects can be delivered in uh, the network timetable. Uh, time Toby Patrick Bailey, I'm the head of planning and performance in North and East Street. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is some of our thinking in project speed around at what points uh, in the enhancement development process we could be starting to consider uh, the way in which the timetable might respond to uh, the development, the, or the enhancement projects, and how we can satisfy whether or not certain changes to the infrastructure are going to realise particular benefits, and indeed how different changes to the infrastructure uh, can fit together um, in the timetable. Uh, I particularly like um, sort of the, the use of the word timetable both as a verb and as a noun. Uh, so we'll uh, <laughs> we'll work around the idea that today is a verb for the, the purposes of, uh, of this conversation as an activity. So first uh, question, I, I'm going to ask you all, um, what is your view what of what is a timetable? Um, what is this thing as a as a noun this time around? Uh, I'm going to hopefully prove my IT capabilities here and make this show your answers. Oh, I particularly like that. A promise to passengers. That's good. A schedule showing when and where trains should run. A schedule. OK. Any other thoughts? Plan for delivering train services. OK, on the pathing of trains, I like it. Here we go, we've got a couple of more. Document detailing which trains are at what stations and at what time, uh, a, a train schedule, a schedule that trains run to. Oh, I like that, a reliable form of connecting people to places. Product offering to customers. Ah, here we go. Some someone has, uh, has has definitely got their head on for for train planning rules. Uh, someone who's uh, who's been around this a little bit, I think. What gets done when? Good. Right. Um, so uh, this is an Oxford definition: a, a chart showing the departure and arrival times of trains, buses, or aircraft. Uh, and what I I so started to pick out from some of those responses is the understanding of what what the component parts of that timetable might be. Now there's lots of ways of, of constructing a timetable. Uh, you, know, you can put different things in different orders, you can prioritize uh, different train services over different lines, over different junctions, but the things that you must have is an understanding of the infrastructure capability, uh, the things that are on screen now at the moment, signaling capability, platform lengths, line speeds, etc. Um, you've got to be able to understand the way in which the rolling stock you're intending on using is going to perform uh, to help understand how it will go between A and B, acceleration, braking power, 
uh, length and weight, you know, particularly important in respect to freight services. And then one of the often missed factors is the, the amount of human factors that have to be considered. Uh, so that's both just the way in which the system is used, 12 times um, you know, how many people are we expecting to bring on and off a train? Um, you know, and those human factors interacting with rolling stock. So things like you know, door apertures and, and open and shutting times, how do they in fact impact dwell times? But then also, and, and really importantly, um, especially you know, from a network rail perspective, is to really understand the resource and rostering constraints that go around the development of a timetable. Um, things like uh, train crew knowledge, um, constraints that are, are operating customer space in respect of agreements with um, particular uh, trade unions and indeed with with uh, um, driver and train crew community around things like changing ends, when how regularly a, a P and B break should exist in a particular diagram, and that can all affect the way in which the timetable is built. So it's an incredibly complex um, product with lots and lots of contributory factors. Uh, and what we're going to talk a little bit about today is that clearly if we change things on the left hand side, things in the middle can either be affected or indeed we might introduce new rolling stock as part of changes to the infrastructure and then that can feed through into changes to the way in which um, the railway system is used and operated and delivered and I need to understand all of these things to be able to start developing a view of how a timetable is going to come together. Now given you know, particularly those human factors and things like resourcing and rostering etc one of the things that, that I like to try and differentiate is the principle between what a timetable is and a operationally deliverable plan is. So we prefer to use the term industry plan. It's something that, that you know, is built to deliver a set of train schedules, but we know how those train schedules are going to be delivered and have got all of those other factors incorporated. And what this work stream has, has looked to understand um, albeit at a, a comparatively you know, low level of maturity to some of the other project speed work streams, is what is necessary to develop industry agreed planning principles and translate that into an industry plan in order to inform uh, an outline business case of a programme. So effectively to get to a point where within the um, decision making framework and the, the you know, opportunities to influence business cases, can we demonstrate that the timetable will respond to the things that we are looking to deliver such that the benefit is enabled. Now just a little bit around why that is different um, in, in practice to how some of the, the ways in which we work um, currently uh, and I, I hasten to add and, and you know, very clearly this isn't um, universal so I recognise different uh, projects and programmes have, have tried to respond to this type of challenge um, differently. So not necessarily universal, but you know, comparatively normal practice is for us to understand what the train service might look like over the geography that we're delivering our enhancement programme. Um, we will understand specifically what infrastructure we think we are going to deliver. Sometimes we might pick out some dependencies. We will test the infrastructure designs to understand what uh, timetable planning rules might be created by that infrastructure capability. Uh, and then we will typically bring together some indicative timetable type work, either through network rail or through our supply chain to help demonstrate that the particular train service over that particular bit of geography is likely to be deliverable. And what that does is typically say, well, if we build this bridge or we do this, um, improvement to signalling capability or we deliver that line speed, we can make it go quicker between A and B or we can resolve this type of challenge. What we think needs to be different is to be able to move towards a better understanding of how in changes to the train service interact at a network level. So you bring together a network level view of that train service specification. The infrastructure changes um, need to be drawn on both within the uh, programme itself, but also particularly understand key dependencies and relationships and other things that are likely to change over a period of time, such that we don't say, well, in 10 years we'll deliver this infrastructure, but we find over the next 10 years some of those benefits have been eroded by other interventions. We'd look at the point where we're, we're taking some of the infrastructure that, that has been developed to articulate this is its capability, but then also translate that into once we've understood the capability of the infrastructure, 
what are the planable values that we, we expect to see created in the timetable planning rules? Now, thinking about things like um, performance uh, resilience in between a technical value and a planning value, or indeed the different um, uh, human factors that might influence some of those planning values, particularly around stations, et cetera. We would be looking to try and, and provoke good industry engagement, working across network rail operators and the supply chain to bring together timetable information or industry plan so that everyone can see and understand the relationship between the enhancement programme we're delivering, potential system interventions and benefit we're likely to get at the end of it. And importantly, it provides a level of assurance around the, the likelihood of delivering the benefit. It doesn't say just delivering this output infrastructure wise will enable trains to go between A and B. It says that if you make trains go between A and B, you can still make it fit at C and at D and that you know, overall that journey time improves. Uh, a colleague of mine um, who I have great respect for has described a, a, a tendency for us to build sort of motorways between um, you know, multi-storey car parks that we don't necessarily consider all of the things that need to take place around the network to be able to properly embed and deliver um, improvements to the timetable and some of, of that sort of thinking is what we're trying to provoke here. So uh, why is this important? Now um, I'll take all of your feedback either via the email or via the, uh, the chat link around my misuse of Venn diagrams. Um, this is intended to be illustrative but, but hopefully to give you a little feel for how some of these things overlap. Um, you know if we don't properly understand the relationship between the infrastructure development and the system outcomes that we're trying to deliver. We can end up with making investment decisions based on relatively sort of fragile out, uh, assumptions. And we might be thinking that that you know just because we've delivered X improvement in the infrastructure over here that we can assume Y will remain the same, but Y is you know, quite likely to change and we have to be able to, to understand those relationships. We can end up with network and system integration requirements overlooked. Um, you know, for example, enhancing platform lengths in stations across uh, the network, but failing to recognise that trains go between points at one end of the network and another, and not enhancing the uh, platform length at the terminal station. We can end up with complications then in establishing network change. Uh, as we start to identify that actually some of the infrastructure uh, changes are going to have a potentially adverse or unexpected impact on the way in which the train service is delivered. We can then find that changes to programme scope or, or outputs of the programme aren't fully informed by what the likely impact is on the programme outcomes and benefits, and I'm talking particularly about the train service there. Um, you know, given the length of infrastructure programmes at times, it's not unusual for what we assumed um, at the start to be slightly different to what we delivered at the end. And if if we don't properly understand the changes that occur in between, we can end up with a different benefit or a different output or outcome delivered at the end. And unfortunately, that can lead to a level of unforeseen trade offs in connectivity, performance or service. And this is about trying to make sure that that when we deliver a piece of, uh, of infrastructure change, we deliver the product to passengers and to end users. Um, you know, and, and that is the thing that ultimately delivers the benefit. Uh, you know, journey times improve productivity. Um, connectivity can, can create economic growth and it's all about delivering that outcome at the end, uh, not necessarily delivering the infrastructure on its own. And um, you're know, drawing a little bit on, on some of the lessons we've learned, particularly in, in timetable world over the last sort of three or four years. Um, if a lot of these issues or a lot of these complexities are left until towards the end of the, the process, we can lead ourselves into a place where we overwhelm industry timetable production processes. And taken together, that can lead to a failure to deliver the benefits of enhancement to the railway. Um, and indeed, the worst case scenario is we can potentially degrade the levels of service that we offer to passengers and users. Now, uh, this is a very complex uh, picture and I'm not going to, to spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, but what this does do is it gives a little feel for why things can be quite difficult now. Um, so this is a picture from a bit of work that the system operator led a couple of years ago in part of their end to end programme. 
Um, and I take absolutely no credit for the picture on the screen, but, but what I think it really does do is it helps to draw out just how many relationships there are between um, the delivery of an infrastructure scheme, the way in which um, at least sort of three announcements this morning uh, that, that things like the franchising process can affect things, um, the way in which network rail enters into contracts with uh, railway undertakings to establish uh, track access rights and track access agreements, and then the way in which they flow through into timetable development. Um, now, this, this do isn't a linear process. It, it sort of ends up being quite circular. But at any point, any break in those chains can create some of that friction that I, I talked about a little bit earlier on. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that right up our, at the front of this process, on the left hand side of that diagram, we're giving adequate consideration to the way in which infrastructure schemes might influence the timetable so that hopefully through the rest of this process um, you end up with greater alignment, greater confidence of benefit delivery uh, and indeed you should get into a position where the timetable development processes are effectively delivering something that we know is going to work as opposed to having to pick up something that is um, it, too often uh, brand new or alternatively um, still has issues to address. So pausing there for a second uh, and inviting you all to take part in, a, in another bit of a poll, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, why do projects fail? Um, you should find on the link that there is a, a list of um, options for you to choose from as, as opposed to giving you the opportunity to find individually. Um, but uh, later on, I'm sure we can provide the opportunity for you to add to your thoughts. Um, so please do tell me, uh, why do you think projects Okay, so we seem to be, we're swaying towards the purple boxes. Uh, we've got unrealistic timescales, keeping pace and lack of direction and support also up there. Refresh that. Unrealistic timescales overtaking uh, direction there. Um, other doesn't seem to be very popular. Orders absence of or difficulty in implementing technology. So that's an interesting one. OK, unrealistic timescales is, uh, is is catching up a little bit with uh, changing requirements. I'll give that one last refresh just to allow a couple of others to respond. Or for my internet to fail. There we go. Right, OK, so of 88 respondents, we have uh, oh, very different set of numbers there, so I assume that must be a, a percentage then, so that must be 69. Oh, can't quite be right. Anyway, the uh, the graph appears uh, relatively clear. Most of you seem to think incomplete or changing requirements. Um, uh, the, our survey said, or rather somebody else's survey said, because this is not uh, a network rail answer, it is not railway orientated. I, I hasten to add this, uh, the source of this is from a Standish Chaos report from 1995. It uh, focused on IT projects, but what it does do is it really highlighted that, that nearly 50% of projects didn't achieve what they expected to, predominantly because of um, issues in requirements. So be that that they were incomplete, they changed, they were unrealistic, they were unclear, um, you know, user input into them wasn't quite what it needed to be. Um, and then uh, you know, a, a set of other far more um, uh, trivial um, numbers associated with other causes there and, and you'll note that, that the options I gave you were aligned to uh, those options. Now um, at, at the bottom there I've included some verbatim from the Association of Project Management's uh, recent research. The conditions um, nearly 80% of projects fail to wholly meet their planned objectives. Um, around 22% wholly met their original objectives, but 90% considered their project to be to some degree successful. Um, and then 92% of respondents that said the goal should be more clearly specified. Now, in railway terms, I think 
uh, the third bullet point down there, over 90% consider their project to be to some degree successful is a fantastic um, example where we probably delivered changes to the railway infrastructure. We hopefully delivered them on time and, and hopefully delivered them you know, safely and, and in a way that, that, that forms um, positively. And then I suspect that, that of those, you know, a, a far lower percentage have actually delivered the benefit in the timetable that we really wanted to see realised. And that, that, although not a, a direct translation, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to try and offer a, a guess as to how many uh, railway projects um, might be in that sort of percentage, but that, that I think starts to give a good feel for just how, how much we need to focus on making sure that we can enable those benefits in the timetable as a way of delivering those benefits properly. So what did the project speed work stream uh, start to, to focus on? So, so uh, as a relatively simple concept, what we wanted to really focus on is how we make sure that the golden thread of um, delivering a train service change to passengers and freight end users is considered throughout the project life cycle. Uh, and indeed, that, that everything that we do throughout that project life cycle lines up towards that delivery of that, that outcome. You know, not about infrastructure outputs, but about how those infrastructure outputs influence the delivery uh, of the benefit of passengers and freight users. And that everywhere within that project or every part of that project, we ought to be able to have that line of sight and understand what contribution is being made as part of that investment towards that, that uh, influence on the timetable. Now, what we're hoping for is that, that we should get into a position where a concept timetable is developed that is able to demonstrate how the project outcomes are likely to be achieved and importantly provide clarity of network integration requirements. Now I'm not necessarily talking individually about system integration of individual programs but about network integration of programs and the way in which the rest of the network operates and that's a, quite an important feature and I'll give a little bit of an example of that um, later. So what does that mean across each area of, of that uh, diagram on the right hand side? So within our project outcomes, what we're looking to get into is that we have really understood what sort of train service we think needs to be in place to be able to deliver those outcomes. Um, thinking from a systems engineering perspective, you know, we might want to say the, the capability to move X amount of people between locations or move people at, at between those locations within Y uh, amount of time and then be able to work through how that influences um, the train service uh, and then how what infrastructure is required to be able to deliver that level of train service. We're looking for us to understand how those um, outcomes might impact current train services, understand clearly what sort of boundaries we're operating within, both geographical limits and rail system boundaries, what interdependencies exist, levels of performance that we're expecting to deliver, uh, and start to understand what levels of un uncertainty exist, because I think that's an important thing to draw out, that, that clearly there are levels of uncertainty, um, but proactively managing those levels of uncertainty is, is an important part of managing the program. Then we'll be looking for, for the um, you know, infrastructure programmes to better understand what good operation looks like, um, you know, engage with that end user. The uh, Standish report I showed you earlier on said something about um, end user requirements and understanding end user requirements. Um, you know, train operators, network rail routes, they operate that railway. Um, they will continue to be the people that operate that railway. So are the things that we're developing uh, and, and looking to deliver as an infrastructure output going to enable the successful operation of the railway and that level of things that we're looking for? Looking to understand the, you know, the current capability as well as the performance of the infrastructure, uh, and that is both from uh, rolling stock an infrastructure perspective, trying to define what the key operating constraints are. So, for example, you know, better understanding the way in which the infrastructure is intended to be used. Are we able to get into a position where we can define how we expect to see that timetable constructed? Um, you know, the priority movements over particular junctions, the expected draw on power supply, etc. Uh, I've spoken a little bit about key planning constraints, but one of the things that that um, we've found across sort of the network is that there's there's typically you know, a couple of golden locations where we, we don't really like to pick up the timetable and shake it all up. We don't want to have the entire timetable change each time we try to deliver an infrastructure element. So there's often 
what we'll sort of call golden locations or golden trains, and they they become a linchpin for the way in which the kinds will emerge. Um, not necessarily always the right thing to do, but certainly in starting to map out early on in a concept timetable way where we think they might be, because um, that enables us to build a concept timetable and potentially challenge and tweak some of those golden um, your principles early on, um, and we can start to move towards a, a better system integration element. Uh, and then quite importantly also, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to try and pick out some of the safety requirements, particularly around things like level crossing risk. Looking for programmes to make sure that, that early on in the, um, in the development of, of, a, of a programme, we are starting to test what timetable planning rules we think are necessary in order to deliver the train service. Now that is again a fundamental sort of mindset shift in the way in which uh, we often approach this. Typically we design some infrastructure and then say what's the timetable planning rule that is likely to be enabled by that? What's the headway? What's the junction margin that, that putting signals or uh, track circuits in these locations enables? As opposed to saying in order to deliver the train service that, that this program is seeking to deliver, the timetable planning rule needs to be and the infrastructure we need to deliver in order to achieve X looks like this. And that's, that is quite a, a significant shift in mindset and, and does need us to, to think differently about the way in which we develop these programmes. And then also um, you know, provoking the opportunity to understand what confidence exists in current timetable planning rules. Where are there opportunities to help improve performance? And how is this railway going to be maintained after we've delivered it? Um, yeah, the, the timetable needs to respond to the way in which um, the railway is going to be operated day in, day out. It, it'd be an awful position to get to that we designed a set of infrastructure, delivered a train service and found that we were unable to provide sufficient maintenance activity or sufficient safe access to maintain the railway. We need to engage with our operators and, and um, clients to understand the rolling stock assumptions that are going to go alongside that length traction, number of units, where are we assuming that they're going to be stabled and maintained? Um, and what are we what are we assuming in respect of things like depot capacity, particularly if there are opportunities or, or requirements to inform the locations of where they are? And, and sort of lastly, before I think we get into a place where we actually have a level of information to build a concept timetable, um, we move more into that, that train crew and operations end of the world. So, Again, how are we going to operate that railway? What assumptions are we making about train crew locations, volumes and knowledge? Um, are there areas of technology that we're looking to incorporate in the way in which the railway is delivered and what impact does that have in the way in which the, the, the service is resourced? And what sort of visibility do we have at this point around things like signal workload or regulation assumptions, both in, to inform the way in which uh, we uh, develop the programme, but also inform the way in which we structure the time. So from all of those considerations, you get into a position where each of them can help to inform a concept of operation. And that is an augmentation of an existing product we typically develop as part of the programme. But starts to add into the concept of operations, not just what are we expecting to deliver and how do we expect it to work, but also what are the governing principles that, that inform the way in which the timetable is going to demonstrate that that, that uh, infrastructure is operable. If we develop that, we're able to start thinking about the way in which a concept timetable can be delivered. And that concept timetable can both inform and demonstrate a business case. It can challenge a business case. It can demonstrate that further investment in certain areas is required. It may demonstrate that some efficiency and optioneering is possible. Um, but it also starts to draw in some of the, the wider opportunities to consider in respect of development, such as the depot and stabling capability making sure that early in a programme we identify that there might be investments in rolling stock that are required either in terms of their capability or in terms of volume. We can get into a position where we better identify and quantify system dependencies and risks and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later on. Um, and and in quite importantly what it gets us into a position of is that once we we have that in a, in a, as an output we can start to understand what the implications are of change. So if there is a change to the programme scope and output, or the, indeed the, the things that, that we're being asked to deliver, we are able to revisit that concept timetable and start to, to redevelop and demonstrate this is the implication of the way in which the, train, the timetable is likely to respond to that particular situation. So a couple of key things to really understand. Um, 
clearly you're getting into a place where we have some some really clear project outcomes that, that are both well understood and mapped into the way in which we expect to see the train service delivered is important. We have to have development activity really clearly aligned to achieving um, train service outcomes and understanding the way in which the timetable planning rules need to, to emerge. And we have to really understand um, the network relationships and dependencies that exist for every programme. And that's a really important feature because uh, rarely do we deliver an infrastructure program um, and operate a train service only on the infrastructure we've developed regularly for you I've put on a high 90 percentage assumption that that our programs are part of a wider network of, of train services that operate so this is a little bit about network relationships and dependencies and this is this is drawing on a piece of trial um, activity that we've been undertaking aligned to the transpennine route upgrade uh, this is the number of schedules that have been included within an uh, indicative train service specification. So on the left hand side, we have the um, programs uh, indicative train service specification. That is the numbers of trains were assumed to operate over the programs infrastructure and some of the key uh, relationships um, that exist at locations on the programs geography. And on the right hand side, we have a project speed um, train service specification that we've developed drawing from the um, project scope and outcomes. What are we expecting to deliver over the Transpennine route? And then each coloured bar on the right hand side represents where we have drawn in and incorporated additional train services. Um, actually, I, let me change my language and be very careful. Where we've drawn in existing train services um, in different parts of the network. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what each colour represents. But that, you know, one colour will be Manchester, one colour will be the East Coast Main Line, another colour will be the West Coast Main Line, and another colour will be um, South and West Yorkshire, where we can see that a train presenting into Leeds, as an example, has an, a, you know, a myriad effect on, on the way in which Leeds might operate and interact with other trains. And in building our concept timetable from um, the EIU proposal, has given us a really helpful opportunity to understand how interventions on the PIU programme are likely to impact and affect the wider network train service across the north of England, as opposed to just on the TIU um, infrastructure in its own right. And some of those relationships and dependencies are things that we are now seeking to understand and explore more within TIU to use that, that concept timetable to provoke um, good conversations about making sure we're delivering the right thing and understanding the right implication from a train service in different locations that are not necessarily between York, Leeds and Manchester. So um, when does it stop being, um, I'll use the term simple. So one of the things that, that's really been difficult is that um, once you start to see change to uh, a, a concept timetable, all this concept of operations, um, or a change to the program or change to the network elsewhere, um, you, you sort of start to see different parts of those building blocks turning a little bit into sand and starting to wobble a little bit. Um, so if, if a particular part of the program changes, you've got to go back and, and understand that impact on the concept timetable on the operations. Um, if there's a change to technology, you do the same thing. But where it becomes really complicated, is when there's changes to existing train services or existing planning rules, uh, when other programmes or other train services are specified over relevant bits of geography, or when other infrastructure changes occur over said relevant geography. So taking that PRU example that I spoke about earlier on, if uh, train services uh, across the north of England make a set of assumptions that say, um, you know, let's take the Scarborough branch as a good example, um, you know, it's, it's not on the York, Leeds, Manchester core corridor, but changes on the Scarborough branch and infrastructure change on the Scarborough branch would get us into a position where trains present differently at York onto the Transpennine route. Um, and understanding how each of those, those implications uh, affect each programme's timetable has become really quite difficult for us to understand. And that's an area that we really want to spend a bit of time thinking about and understanding. It, it, it's great if we can move each of our core programs into understanding this concept timetable position. But at what point does it cease to be over relevant geography and actually start to become this big network 
of, of future timetables, uh, and, and that's you know, bigger than my brain can comprehend. Another area that we've, we've we found challenging is the decision-making criteria in building a concept timetable is uh, a work through. Um, yeah, there's, there's relatively clear contractual um, decision-making criteria that exist for developing timetables on a regular basis. But once you move out of that productionized or uh, environment, places where um, you know, track access rights don't exist and, and where potentially you know, constraining the way in which we, we flex and change the train service um, no longer is, is necessarily the right thing to do. How do you go about that activity and make sure that you're not um, adversely affecting the way in which the, the train service emerges? And then another challenging area that we're, we're trying to work through is that principle of, of once you've built something and you're managing this concept timetable, how does that feed through that complicated diagram I showed you early on um, by the system operator, which, which shows the, the progression through um, sort of through the track access rights elements, through any replacement of the franchising uh, system, uh, through into the network code part D processes, which I, I'm sure may also be affected by announcements today, um, and in uh, you're potentially for drawing on things like event steering groups. So our next steps, um, like I say, it's uh, a relatively uh, immature work stream within Project Speed. There's plenty to, to, to go at in terms of thinking and lots of learning to go about. One of the things that we're really clear we want to do is start to communicate some very clear guidance to, to Network Rail projects and sponsorship teams about how to, how to subtly shift some of that thinking towards delivering train service outputs and outcomes in a timetable as opposed to, to delivering infrastructure outputs and what sort of questions should we be asking at, at different times in development and indeed what sort of different things make up different levels of complexity of particular programs because the last thing we want to do is see uh, us get into a position where we end up delivering long complicated timetabling activities for something that might be far less complicated or, or far easier for the timetable to respond to. We look to establish how best network rail um, train operators and uh, the supply chain could respond to what will effectively be an enhanced timetabling demand. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a finite resource across the industry. Um, it, you know, it's a, a number of specialist skills and we need to be able to make sure that we are focusing on the right questions at the right time to help inform the way in which the, the timetable can be developed in support of programmes. And then lastly, um, we need to spend a bit of time thinking about relationships between um, uh, the, the conversation that Mike uh, took us through earlier and the PACE framework and the things that I've just taken you through there around things like improving the content concept operations and how do we make sure that that timetable is in place to help inform um, business cases in the future. Now I, I have one last poll for you which I'm not going to show answers to but, but I'd like you to uh, answer um, as we go through the Q&A please. Um, this is more for my selfish benefit than anything else. Uh, I'd love to understand what you think you can do differently in your role, help ensure that, that we have better line of sight to the delivery of train service outcomes around the way in which we develop. Now. So please do populate that uh, as we work through the q and I'm really looking forward to seeing your responses. And um, David, uh, over to you for questions. Thank you very much, Ruby. Um, the, I mean, what, what you've just highlighted there, I think, is uh, apart from a sort of uh, a bit of a masterclass in how to think about timetabling, um, is that everything that we're doing when we think about projects, we're trying to build a railway uh, and, uh, you know, a railway is to provide, you know, it's putting passengers first as we as we talk about uh, these days, uh, quite rightly. Um, but you're highlighting the sort of things that often, certainly in the supply chain, we talk about being important things, things like focusing on the outcomes uh, rather than the inputs and, and thinking about a whole system approach. And I think all too often we're guilty of thinking about a whole system approach in terms of does the engineering work rather than does it deliver a railway? Um, so I found that really, really uh, fascinating. Um, can I cheat and ask the first question, which is um, we've, we heard earlier from Mike about pace and obviously that replaces grip. Where, when does all this normally happen in, in grip and when will it happen in pace? Are we talking grip one here or are we talking through to grip three in, or in the new pace language? That's a, so that's a, 
a fascinating question, David, that I, I can't can't necessarily pinpoint an exact point where I think that I, I can answer to. Um, and the reason for that is that let, let's take that TRU program as an example. Different elements of that program are going to progress through that that governance framework at different points. Uh, and that that has steered so far, Mike and I, to, to think about, well, well, you know, what, how do you incorporate this as part of a, a, a program development cycle as opposed to individual projects, if that makes sense. Um, an area we're, we're focused on is to try and, and remove sort of the alignment to the idea of individual projects, uh, individual sort of components of pace or with grip, and to try and focus more towards the um, enhancement um, development cycle for funding. So, so to, to look to try and, and draw on each part of or component part of a programme by the point in time at which Work Network Rail is proposing to progress its business case towards an outline business case with, with uh, funders we would look to have each of those questions answered. Um, I don't think I can necessarily point at a specific point in, in either grip or in pace as a framework to say it's there. Um, but what I do need is my my sort of the, my sponsorship colleagues to be thinking around how the different maturity of the individual projects within that portfolio are likely to influence that concept of operations and timetable in, in time to inform that business case. And, and of course, timetabling is like pace just one of the work streams in in uh, speed so this is about bringing uh, um, all of the, those work streams together to create a, a better outcome which leads neatly into the first sort of audience question which is um, in terms of the challenges speed poses what level of opportunity do you think might exist in future for planning and making timetable changes when we are ready rather than having to plan around or wait for the May, December timetable change dates. And maybe the Mr. Anonymous, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous who asked that has maybe observed that we've found, we've been able to change timetables quite quickly in the last year when we've had to. I was wondering if I was going to get something like that. Um, I, I was thinking about, about making sure there was a caveat in the invitation that I wasn't planning on, on talking about sort of development uh, timetables and, and the way in which we might progress from where we are. but. So it's a great question. Um, I think it's really important to understand the way in which a, a timetable moves from being that that chart of, of movements into something that is implemented um, and, and is operationally deliverable. And there's so many moving pieces in between the point at which we say, uh, you know, tada, here's our new chart of a timetable and trains running differently. So things like resourcing activities, union consultation, signal of briefings, your rewrite of, of regulation statements uh, and, and all of that sort of operational readiness activity that hasn't necessarily been changed in the way in which uh, people might think it has been changed over the last sort of year or so. A lot of what we've done during COVID hasn't necessarily been um, rewrite the timetable from bottom up each time we've gone through a, a change in restrictions. It's been to, to incrementally work down from a product and then back up from a product. And yes, there have been some changes within that, but ultimately, you know, everything that we have in place supports the top product. Now, with with enhancement projects and responding to, to you know, changes to the timetable, at the moment, what we do is we typically align them to major timetable changes that December and May each year. And there may be opportunities for us to think about the way in which you might incrementally release a benefit. But what I don't think we're going to get into a position very quickly of is being able to say right we've delivered it yesterday can we do can we you know, realize that benefit in a week's time we're still going to want to have that you know confidence in in delivery um you know, learning lessons from may 18 making sure that there is you know a, an understandable gap between infrastructure entry into service and the delivery of a timetable and the implementation of that timetable um, but there are absolutely opportunities for us to be able to increase the confidence that, that what goes into the timetable development cycle then into resourcing is informed by what we've done in a program such that we might be able to condense that, that the i don't know if you've you're probably aware of this but i don't know if you've looked at this uh, japanese the shinkansen timetabling model and as a non-timetabling expert i describe it as they, de they develop a timetable which absolutely maxes out everything they can do with the shinkansen route and then on a given day, they turn off what they don't need. So they 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 
I mean, it's not that they're cancelling services, but they have a uh, uh, the timetable has um, has services that are sort of co you know, effectively optional. So when you get to the platform, you look and it tells you which particular level of service is running this day. Uh, and they have this, the rolling stock to deal with literally the bank holidays uh, where they put on the absolute max service and on quieter periods they put on less. So, you know, what's this, you know, what's the scope for us to uh, to 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 have that sort of approach? Uh, I mean, I, I um, you're probably more pages through this morning's output than I am, David, but but um, I'm, I'm not going to try and draw on anything that, that I've read in the last 24 hours to answer the question. Um, and if I could answer the question, David, I, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting in front of you all now. The, the, there is a um, there is capability in in the, the timetabling process to be able to passively create capability. You know, th there isn't um, a, a barrier to being able to say, look, in in May 2022, we're planning on operating this level of train service. So let's let's assume that level of train service is there now and incrementally release the benefit. You know, that that capability exists, um, but sometimes that can create suboptimal outcomes in the short term. Um, so some of the trade offs that might be necessary to release that capability are introduced before the capacity is needed for that future train service. Um, you know, what you've just described is a pretty good example of, of really how you know, the COVID process has particularly worked for timetabling, you know, in, incrementally easing down and then back up again um, you know, for the most part. Um, uh, I don't I don't foresee that we will quickly get into a position where we we create that that latent capability, but I absolutely do expect that, that system operators timetable planning uh, reform process is likely to, to call out some of those potential opportunities. So, so, so there's a question here which uh, will really appeal, appeal to uh, those of us in the audience who, you know, sort of like building things, uh, the, the um, supply side and, and uh, our network, our colleagues. How, how much influence does the timetable exert on the availability of possessions and the lead time to get possessions agreed, approved? Or a variation on that is, is how do you consider the work that might need to be done both capital and maintenance when you're designing a timetable? Uh, so I, I'm trying to answer sort of a variation or variant one, if I'm allowed to use um, th those terms these days. Um, so I, it, it influences it a lot. And um, I think that's the right thing. I think we don't necessarily get the right balance between engineering work and timetables at, at points. Um, but you know, ultimately, we we, do, we deliver engineering work to deliver a train service. What we don't want to see is people stop using the train because we're doing all of that engineering work. Um, yeah, we, what we want to be able to do is achieve the right balance between the, the engineering access that is necessary to safely and efficiently and effectively deliver engineering work, deliver a timetable that moves people between the points they need to be and moves freight goods in the way that they need to be moved, um, and that in a way that we adequately communicate to people. Uh, and a lot of what we can do or should be moving towards is better industry you know, collaboration to achieve that. You know, at the moment, there are too many competing priorities as opposed to an opportunity to, to work across those priorities together. Um, uh, variation two, David, I think I, I sort of heard you think, talking a little bit more about how you can make the timetable better enable things like engineering work uh, and maintenance opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a great opportunity yeah early on in that that concept of operations piece for us to better specify the way in which we intend to maintain the railway. Um, too regularly what can happen at the moment is we deliver a bit of infrastructure, we deliver a timetable and then we challenge ourselves, oh god how are we going to maintain it, what, what's going to be the white period, what's the gap between trains that's created etc. As opposed to getting into a place where we might say we're going to have this level of train service, now what infrastructure might be necessary or what changes might be necessary to achieve certain margins between trains or to achieve you know, access points and lockout devices at all the right places to be able to safely and efficiently access the track. And, and that concept timetable can, can influence all sorts of considerations far earlier than they are now. So thanks Toby. To the, ne the next question is, how how do we ensure that this approach doesn't lead to the problem of building to a timetable where the infrastructure is designed to deliver a specific timetable 
rather than a flexible level of capacity capability. Um, so, you know, I think that's, you know, to what extent do we have some future proofing by having some capacity and capability beyond what the bare minimum needed by the timetable? Yeah, uh, I mean, that that's a that's a fantastic question because the the last thing you want to see is is delivery of of infrastructure scope that gets us into a position where the timetable just fits um, and then you know, on the first level of perturbation that the whole thing falls down. Um, one of the the things that we've we've got to be able to to harness as part of this is the opportunity to iterate that concept timetable. So it may be the case that, that as part of delivering a network integrated plan, we say that, that interventions are necessary in different places we hadn't necessarily thought about. Um, and the next part needs to be, well, these are the service options that, that you can put in place to choose between the delivery of this specific program output and other things here. Now that might mean that then the program output is change controlled accordingly in order to be able to make the service interventions and choices. But ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to provoke those options and those trade offs and that that timetable construct uh, earlier on, as opposed to what is happening at the moment, which is sort of towards the development cycle. We, we end up in sort of a level of industry friction saying, well, we're going to have to take this part out of the contract, change control, that expectation out. Um, you know, that engineering is important. There's a fantastic lot of debate and wisdom being uh, put into the chat here, which uh, hopefully is matched by uh, what's been put in your uh, poll. Um, but there's some you know, really good comments and there's, there's a strong appeal, uh, uh, quite a lengthy appeal to make sure that this is properly briefed to your uh, network rail capital delivery colleagues so that they can really uh, engage with it. So that, that that's that's really positive. Um, Another question getting quite a lot of likes here is should the potential timetable plan be modelled and confirmed during the development and development and initiation stage to make projects more efficient? This would then support network change during the design element of the process. Which I think the answer might be yes. I, I, yeah, I, I think it, I think I can offer a short answer to that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think yeah, absolutely with bells on it. Um, uh, so what so scrolling up my list of questions um ah this is a good one yeah so and and, and I, I i mentioned the shinkansen thing before i'd even seen this or, or um, in terms of creating timetables are lessons taken from leading countries in terms of timetable re reliability and punctuality netherlands to name one I may not necessarily be the best person to, to ask that question. Um, I would absolutely endorse the idea that, that as part of, of that sort of project speed uh, scope I've just taken you through, that we ought to do the levels of benchmarking and understand um, where, where we see that, that best practice elsewhere. Um, uh, the system operator has previously done you know, a fair amount of, of benchmarking activity to understand its timetable development processes and where it can learn. Uh, and also you know, Network Rail is, is um, a, a member of, of RailNet Europe and has, has done a lot of work with, with the um, European infrastructure managers to better align and harmonise some of the timetabling activity. Uh, and I do know there's a lot of, of shared good practice in, in those forums, but but I'm not as, as well placed as I should be to be able to answer on, on the production end of the timetable world. The um, next question up is, when introducing a new station on an existing network, as well as extending the train journey time, how do you quantify the human factor if the usage is unknown? particularly during a time of low usage that we're experiencing now. How long does the process take to run the proposed services through the model? So so that's the um, the big unknown. You build a new station, you that's that's put a uh, you know extra time into your timetable. Um, how 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 is that dealt with? Well, so so putting a, a new station in place has got more than just the consideration of that dwell. Obviously, you've got sort of breaking distances, acceleration distances. Then you've got, got time to for station duties, um, door apertures, uh, dispatch, and then you've got that human element of your know, people getting on and off the train. And that that is impacted by the design of the rolling stock as much as 
or anything else. So um, there's a lot to understand in terms of those those interdependencies. Uh, if we don't know how many people or don't have any forecast of how many people are likely to use said station, um, it suggests that you've actually probably got a bit of a problem further upstream than the idea that, that we should we should um, you'd be worried about specific dwell times. But there are certainly you know, opportunities for us to understand and look at existing TPRs on certain sections of line, understand existing usage, well performance and attainment, both across rolling stock and comparable designs of station. Um, so there are opportunities for us to use what we have now in addition to what we're expecting to deliver in the future to, to answer that. In, in terms of time to model, um, I, I, I'm going to be you know, cautiously use the word. It's not modeling, it's, it's timetable development. It, mo modeling um, is what we'll do after we've done that timetable development to determine things like performance. And uh, taking our PRU trial as an example, that is just over two and a half months to develop. Yeah. I, I was very struck by the graph that you showed of uh, TRU uh, um, bef as it were before and after speed principles and would it be unfair to say that effectively that was identifying all the train services that impacted TRU that should have been considered previously there was a, a lot a lot you know the 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 the, the version one of the scheme hadn't been considered sufficiently holistically um, and I uh, the um, I draw the analogy with um, you know the allegation that um, the Audsell cord is a fantastic engineering scheme and it is but introducing a load of new flat junctions hasn't really helped the help the railway so you know it, it, how how you know are those two sort of worked examples you know have you caught the one with TIU but we didn't catch the one with Audsell Cord? Uh, so I think it would be unfair to say that the TIU one wasn't uh, what it should be um, I think that is consistent with with what um, your programs typically have been asked to, to develop and agree with with um, particularly clients and 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 BFT in respect of of TRU, it, it, is, it was the level of train service that we were seeking to impact by the programme. Those, all those colours were things like, you know, how, how is it likely to, to impact the, um, the, the Cumbrian coast and, and what's the impact on the Harrogate branch over here? And you know, it, it was far and wide ranging. Um, so I don't, I don't think it, it's necessarily a, a problem with TRU. I think I think what was sitting there in, in 1.2, which I think was what the, uh, the the box there was, is is reflective of what was was requested and what we've done through Project Speed is expand that to network integrate as opposed to just think about the program. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, Mortal Court's a great example, isn't it? Uh, but yes, there, I mean, there are opportunities to better understand that timetable impact potentially earlier on. <laughs> There's a question here, but well, it's actually not a question. It's a it's a lessons learned that uh, from Kieran Duncan highlights. Uh, he says, don't ever plan for new rolling stock introduced, infrastructure completed, and timetable change at the same time. A major issue on Northwest electrification. Give the train operators a chance, and th and that that's such good advice. And we must remember actually that Williams comes from the problems of the 2018 timetable change and speed comes from the fact that we're perceived to not be delivering uh, very cost efficiently um, or there's at least more put that more constructively there is a um, there's a major opportunity for us to deliver more cost efficiently um, so just interested in, in you know any any closing remarks on the, on the lessons that you've taken from the work that you've been doing recently. Uh, so um, uh, it's it's reminded me of working through through our, our trial and a lot of the the conversations we've had with operators and across network rail um, to, to get as far as we have just how many people are involved in this part of, uh, of a process and how many system dependencies there are. Um, Kieran's exactly right that that, that, that sort of then wet lesson is important to learn and it's one that we've we've baked into the way in which we work now to have a gap between entry into service and, and timetable realisation. Um, 
but one of the things that I think I've I've really seen is that there is a great opportunity for us to take some of the things that we do in the last six months plus maybe sort of six to twelve months of a program, apply them earlier on and and really value engineer the way in which the rest of that process works, deliver consistency to passengers, improve the way in which we engage you with stakeholders and articulate what we expect to see change and how we expect it to see change. Uh, and to really sort of improve the alignment between infrastructure deliverables and, and the way in which um, we plan to deliver to passengers and end users. So we've seen it in TRU and the work that we've done there. And, and I think we're, I'm, I'm excited about the idea of seeing that elsewhere too. Toby, thank you very much. That's been absolutely fascinating. Who knew we engineers needed to worry about timetabling? I mean, it uh, it's, sh should be so obvious, shouldn't it, that we're trying to build a railway and we the first thing we ought to be thinking about is how we provide a train service so thank you for for taking us through that and really 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 uh, fascinating as i say so um thank you the my, my solo round of applause here but i imagine the hundreds of people on the call will also be thanking you so so, so thank you very much toby um, I'm going to draw the uh, proceedings to a close um, uh, this afternoon now, just a few remarks to make. Uh, so thank you to Sue, to Mike, uh, to Tom and to Toby for giving us their time and their knowledge this afternoon. Thank you also to all of you on online for giving for your time this afternoon and, and such a lot of questions which just illustrates the importance of this and uh, and and the engagement across across the industry. Um, I'm going to pop a feed. I'm going to pop a uh, link in the chat here or in the Q and A for a uh, feedback. We'd really appreciate your your feedback. So we, we'll send this out again by uh, with our um, with the slides and so forth. But we'd really appreciate if you could uh, if you have the time to start filling in that feedback. Uh, so that we can plan future events, which uh, uh, reminds me we'll be sharing the recordings next week and this is intended to be the first of a series of events. We'll have uh, other events covering other themes in June and July. Because you've been registered for this one, you'll automatically get uh, a notification of the next one. Uh, so um, just to close, uh, thank you once again to the speakers. Thank you to, to the audience. And thank you for my colleagues who've been working away in the background to make all this work, what has been hopefully seamlessly for you as viewers. So uh, thank you um, and uh, good afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day.